Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Nicole Coustier about decision-making amidst uncertainty. Nicole Coustier, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks so much for having me, John. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm super excited to have a conversation with you. We've been uh, prepping for this for a while. We finally get a chance to chat. And we're, today we're going to be exploring decision making amidst uncertainty. Now, certainly we're in the prime time of uncertainty. We've all been living it the last 18 plus months during this COVID pandemic. Uh, but even pre-pandemic, it was a pretty uncertain time. Lots of um, lots of hard things happening in the world, and I think uh, messiness, nuance, um, complexity, and uncertainty is kind of the name of the game uh, today. And so we we need to figure out how we can be agile and responsive to the shifting nature of work, the shifting nature of of our businesses, and ultimately, you know, that's that's our only hope if we hope to remain relevant and competitive in a hyper competitive globalized economy, right? And so uh, the the pandemic's just added on to all of this and made it even more important that we figure out how we can be more effective in our decision making, less biased, uh, more uh, more evidence and data driven, uh, and ultimately lean into the complexity, messiness and uncertainty rather than trying to pretend like it's not there, sticking our head in the sand uh, and, and trying to avoid it. Yeah, no question. And I think if there's anything that the pandemic has shown us is that we can use a different lens through which we evaluate our options and actually make those decisions. And I've seen this uh, crystallize in two ways in particular with my clients. And one is that people are recognizing that decision-making can be a very emotional process. And so many times in our work lives and in our professional lives, we try to keep emotion at the door, okay, which, which is fine. And everybody is on this emotional spectrum somewhere. It's not uh, you know, an either or yes, no, but how much you use emotion to make your decisions, um, that's gonna vary for everybody. But I think what a lot of people have recognized <laughs> through the pandemic and we are dealing with local, regional, global events and processing those events is that emotion in decision-making does exist, right? And so, you know, how much you incorporate the emotional aspect into your decision-making, that's up to you, but it's important to recognize that that's there. So that helping my clients yeah. navigate the emotional aspect of decision-making is one thing. But yeah. Before thing, before we move on, Nicole, yeah, um, I do want to share with listeners your your bio uh, because I think that's important for the context of the conversation. Sure. Uh, you're already starting to share some really great principles, uh, so let's hold on that for just a moment. As we get started, I'll just share Nicole's bio with everybody. Nicole Coustier has 25 years in business development and sales strategy, operations management, and program design in a variety of areas such as life science, med tech, government policy, and many more. The coaching Nicole provides is not based just on theory, but on the expertise of 10 plus of those years in senior and executive level management. Nicole worked with a team of exceptional leaders to bring a small consultancy through the crippling 2008 recession to not just succeed, 
succeed, but thrive. And she brings that insight into her daily coaching in the COVID era. Nicole has had the honor of launching talented achievers into countless leadership positions over the years across various organizations through troubled times. While in industry, she mentored others to success to success, now as the head of her own practice, both as an executive performance coach and med tech and VC advisor, she shows great people the path to even greater situations. Uh, love your background, so much oh, amazing expertise and experience that you bring to the table. So again, thank you for joining me and let's dive right back on into the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So in addition to the emotional aspects of decision making. Another thing that I've been helping a lot of my clients with, <clears throat> excuse me, is this concept of how you anchor <clears throat> your choices uh, when you're making a decision. So, so many times people are presented with options, option A, option B, op option C, and they approach decision making from the standpoint of which of those three things that are being presented to me should I pick? When really the pandemic is forcing people to say, well, hold on a minute. Maybe I don't like any of those three options. And maybe I want to create an option D for myself and for my family and for my teams and for anybody that I'm responsible for. And what does that look like? And how do we? create that? And how do I pursue that? And so it's been a very interesting exercise when those two things, the, the emotion involved in decision making, and then putting an option for yourself on the table, those things have always existed in decision making, but it's the COVID era, which are prompting people to explore those things further. Yeah, excellent. And and to loop back on really what what you've uh, framed out for the start of this conversation, um, and I I said it in the introduction. You know, like we we want to be data driven, evidence driven decision makers, but we can't ignore the reality that we are human beings. <laughs> we are social yeah. animals. We are emotional creatures, and and we can't just put our heads in the sand and pretend like we're completely analytical and that we can completely check our emotions at the door. The reality is we all have biases. We all have prejudices. We all have um, these things that influence the way we process the information that we're taking in. So even I can get 10 really intelligent, uh, well-meaning, super competent individuals around the table, all looking at the exact same data and they will come to different decisions, right? They'll, they'll, arrive at different outcomes. Um, does that mean, you know, some of them are more ethical, more, uh, they're just better than others? Uh, sometimes maybe, but a lot of it's just the way we process information. And so being evidence-driven, being data-driven is important, but we also have to recognize the very real human reality that we all filter information in a variety of ways. And depending on how we filter that information, that's going to drive the types of decisions uh, we come to. So we need, we just need to be clear eyed, clear eyed about that. We need to be, recognize that that's happening within us and that can increase the chance that we can sidestep implicit biases that might unduly influence the way we're making decisions and that we can ultimately kind of prioritize what's most important to us in terms of how we're interpreting the evidence that might be available to us. That's right. And I think, you know, getting to the point where we as individuals accept a responsibility for our thought process, our filters, our emotional drivers, it's, it's about awareness, but also accepting responsibility that that is what you are doing when you are going into the decision-making process or deciding how you're going to be showing up in your teams, in your organization, in your network, right? So, for a lot of my clients, what is especially challenging is once they have awareness, they're jumping to the conclusion that, oh my goodness, this is an emotional decision that I'm, that I'm making here. I must stop that. And for me, I'm saying, well, time out. It's good that you've acknowledged that. Now you can make a separate determination. Do I want it to be driven by that? Do I want to feel something else? How do I want to show up? You can layer this that is not, you know, just 
replacing one type of judgment for another knee-jerk judgment, right? So there is the awareness of the bias that you're bringing to the situation. That in and of itself is fantastic. And that allows you to make more informed decisions about how you want to proceed. Yeah, yeah, great points. And so I guess maybe one thing we need to clarify then is how do we start the process of recognizing what those filters are for us, yeah. what maybe our implicit biases are that are impacting is some, you know, it could be negative, but it doesn't have to be negative uh, right. uh, in terms of how those filters play out, but it's just the reality that we all have them. So how do we start that process of dealing with all the complexity and uncertainty around us and understanding ourselves and our filters first? Yeah. So there's a, there's a five-step process, but really I'm going to focus on just the initial steps because that is where so much of the diagnosis can occur. So first is being able to identify facts, cold, hard facts with no adjectives, adverbs, qualifiers, uh, any of those things, just what happened, what somebody said, what the situation is. Then the second step is really asking yourself, uh, what am I making it mean? That is a question that I use daily with people that I'm working with. If those facts, whatever they may be, and all the parties would agree on the same set of facts, what are you making it mean? Are you making it mean something about people's motivations? Are you making it mean a negative thing or a positive thing? Is it an opportunity? Is it a an obstacle, whatever it is, and answering that question is probably that first very, very, very powerful step. The, the next thing is based on what you're making it mean, well, what emotion now comes up for you, right? And so I always give this example of, uh, you know, there's a team meeting and the boss walks into the room and says, guys, we didn't make our numbers last quarter. And there are three different people, but those are the facts, right? Boss walked in, said those words. We did not make our numbers last quarter. One person feels, is making it mean, oh my gosh, I didn't do my job. I, my job is at risk. I'm going to get fired. That person is feeling one thing. The second person is genuinely curious and confused right? That person is making it mean, oh, well, we didn't do what we were supposed to do. That's really confusing. We were expecting to make our numbers and why did that happen? And then the third person can feel super excited because we'll, in, we'll interpret that situation as, oh, there's an opportunity here for me to like swoop in and be the hero next quarter. And I can't wait to get back to my desk and do all the things. So that question, what am I making the situation mean, is a very, very powerful one. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue. What some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There's no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of our problems. The truth is great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. love it. And ultimately, if we can just ask ourselves those questions, we can 
do some critical self-reflection and not pass judgment on ourselves or others, really. It's just about understanding. Uh, and we just need to be able to label what's happening and to be able to understand what's happening. And then we can start to take action to move forward and to address it. Uh, if it is, if it is has, having negative impacts on us or on those around us, of course, then we can be proactive about uh, making adjustments uh, to, to increase our positive influence and impact and, and mitigate any negative uh, harm that might come to others. Uh, but it, it starts with that, that personal understanding first. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the, the nature and the range of uncertainty and messiness and complexity that we're facing right now. Um, you know, if, if we can first start that, to recognize that we have lenses through which we see the world, uh, that influences how we're going to process the data that's put in front of us. So, you know, we can, we can recognize the need to not be fully emotionally driven in our decision making, but it, we're human. And so of course it impacts us. We also need to, to have data and evidence to support what we're doing, but we need to recognize that we're filtering every piece of evidence that comes to us. And we're spinning a narrative in our head um, around what we're going to decide and, and what we're not going to decide. Uh, recognizing all of that now is happening. Now we put that over the top of, you know, this, this ever-changing world um, that's complex, messy, nuanced, and just uncertainty is the name of the game. Um, what, so what's the nature of some of those types of uncertainty that we're dealing with? And how do we start to process that so we don't get stuck in decision paralysis and just you know, I see this all the time. I see, I see well-meaning individuals who just can't pull the trigger on making a decision because they're worried about making the wrong decision or they're worried about, you know, there's, there's more information I don't know. So I have to wait until I gather more information. And then they never decide because they're always gathering more information. And guess what? In a complex, uncertain world, there's always more to, information to gather. Absolutely. Well, and uh, the way I like to frame this is that we should probably get away from the concept that there is a single right answer and lots and lots of wrong answers because that pressure to find the right answer and being so concerned about the downstream effects of a wrong decision will paralyze us. And instead, the framework that I like to use is decisions are very rarely uh, you know, right or wrong, but they fall onto a spectrum somehow of poor to best, right? So there's a there's this continuum of of decision making where uh, it's less about right and wrong and more about making the best decision that you can at any given point in time. And nobody is ever going to make the poor decision, right? That's just not what we do and how we operate. So we are always going to make the best decision that we can. And a lot of times that alleviates a lot of the pressure and the anxiety. But also notice when you are using your future self to judge your current self, right? That's never going to be helpful. Of course, your current self is going to know more, um, and so what? <laughs> you are not your future self yet. So just being able to recognize that I am capable of making the absolute best decision that I can in my shoes right now, that's point number one. Point number two is that it's actually very rare for a decision to be so binding that you can never come back and make adjustments and shifts and even go in another direction. I, I'm not suggesting that it's so easy to do so, but decisions are rarely, rarely so irrevocable that you can't yeah. make adjustments later. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of a black and white mentality that comes back to what you were saying about there being one right answer and a whole bunch of wrong answers. Like that's just a, a, a framing of the world that I'm not sure is very helpful. Right. <laughs> uh, and things aren't black and white. Uh, in my experience, they're almost never that way. And so what I hear you saying is, is different ways of approaching 
lowering the stakes of decision making <laughs> because we get paralyzed when the stakes are so high uh, or we perceive that the stakes are so high that we, we don't want to make the wrong mistake. And so uh, we just we just don't pull the trigger. Um, ultimately, though, if we can recognize that part of growth and development means that there are going to be missteps. Missteps in and of themselves aren't a bad thing. It's just part of growth. It's a part of learning. And to your point about most decisions can be reversed. They can be adjusted. We can iterate. And that's the, the main key that I, I want to bring forward when we're making decisions. If we have a growth mindset, a growth culture within our team, within our organization, and we see decisions as iterative learning Yes. Um, and experimentation. So, so recognizing that if I do say something and we're going to try this thing, that's my decision. That's what we're going to do tomorrow, next week, next month, we may decide we need to go in a completely different direction. And that's okay because that's learning. That's iter that's iterative learning. We're experimenting as we go. And, and by the way, when we are experimenting as we go, we're gathering more data, more information, which can help us hone our decision-making, right? That's absolutely right. And I love the way you talk about decision making as a skill and it being iterative because it is. And the way we sharpen our skills is to practice. You can get better at decision making. The way to do it is to make lots and lots of decisions. Lots and lots. Put yourself in a situation where you, the decision matters. And if you're doing that so infrequently, oh, you could have a crisis of confidence at every single decision. But if you are putting yourself in the situation where I'm going to be learning through this process and I'm going to get better at decision making by making these types of decisions every day, every week, just keep going, keep going, keep going keep going, what you're going to find is you get so much better at it. You're going to be able to filter through all the onslaught of data that you get. You're just going to be better at making the best decision that you can at any point in time, but you do need to practice. Yeah. And that, that practice, um, again, it lowers the stakes of, of a single decision. Uh, and so I don't need to be so fearful. And I can also demonstrate and model for my people. So say I'm leading, I don't know, it could be a small team all the way up to I'm an executive with a whole bunch of people that ultimately uh, I'm responsible for. But when I demonstrate this and model this for my people, then I show them and I give them permission to do the same uh, so that they don't get paralyzed in their own daily work, that they can make, they can have the autonomy to make the decisions they need to be able, they're, they're the experts in their area, right? So I need to lean on their expertise. Not everything should funnel through me in making decisions. I should empower them and delegate as appropriate, you know, to, uh, related to their expertise so they can have autonomy over their own decision-making in their day-to-day -day jobs. And I can demonstrate and model for them how to do that so they can learn and grow and develop. And then things don't get clogged up and log jammed. And, you know, that's like one of those frustrations that everyone has to deal with in most organizations with a lot of bureaucracy. Uh, you know, bureaucracy and policies and procedures, they have a role and they're important. Um, but if they're adding to the decision paralysis and they're adding to um, the ability for us to make timely decisions in order to respond and pivot, you know, to a, a complex um, industry, a complex market and, and ever changing uh, conditions, then we're just shooting ourselves in the foot. And so ultimately lowering the stakes for us is helpful. So we don't have decision paralysis, lowering the stakes for our people also allows them to practice and to learn the art of decision making and they can yeah, and and and, right. and and then they're going to learn what their biases are how their emotions play in all the things we were talking about in the first half of our conversation they're going to learn more about that because they're just doing it constantly yeah that's so true and yeah to br to bring it back around you know you mentioned fear i mean that's what it comes down to right you people are afraid of some negative outcome, some sort of consequence that is going to feel terrible. It's going to feel terrible somehow. And so 
a lot of times to get through some of that paralysis, if it is in fact fear that is preventing people from moving forward, there, uh, there's a beautiful exercise. It's called a fear setting exercise. You're probably familiar with it. Um, it's on, you know, it, there are TED talks about this type of stuff, but you know, so much about our lizard brain, where the fear response comes up is, uh, you know, it's irrational. You know, it's our lizard brain. It's not our prefrontal cortex that is deciding any of this stuff. And so a lot of times what needs to happen is you need to give voice to the fear, no matter how irrational it is. You know, if you are constantly clamping down on that and saying, I'm a professional, I shouldn't be feeling this way, that's crazy, it's irrational, well, then it'll just keep you up at night, right? But to be able to say, I'm afraid of, you know, failing, I'm afraid of looking foolish, I'm afraid of whatever it might be, to be able to voice that and surface, well, if I'm feeling that fear, what is it about my circumstances? What am I making all that mean to, to make me feel so fearful? Um, being able to surface that and to your point, you know, having your teams and your, your, your people recognize that you go through this process and that you understand and appreciate that that's a human process and you have ways of tackling it is a beautiful way to empower people and give others the practice that they need to make better decisions. Yeah, very well said, Nicole. Uh, this has just been a really fun conversation. And I know, note the time, we're about out of time. Um, before we close today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, absolutely. So for, uh, for, venture groups and founders. I have an advisory. They can go to nicolecoustier.com and get more information there. For the executive performance coaching, people can go to aureliancoaching.com and find me there. And in terms of, you know, final, final thoughts around decision-making in uncertain times, just recognize that emotion is part of the process and that, you know, you can put more options on the table for yourself than just the options being presented to you. And that third, uh, being able to recognize that there are ways to get out of paralysis. There are actual techniques that you can use to empower yourself and get over the hump. Um, those are things that you can practice over time and get better at. Wonderful. I completely agree, Nicole. This has just been a fascinating conversation. And I appreciate all of your insights and all of the wisdom that you shared with me and my audience. I encourage listeners to reach out, to get connected, find out more about what Nicole and her team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life.
check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.